Shall we pray? Let's pray. Most gracious and loving Lord, we thank you for your word which has stood the test of time. We thank you for the way in which your Holy Spirit can speak through the words written on paper. We thank you for this Bible, which is the living word, Jesus the Christ. Lord, enable me to speak your truth. Enable us to hear a word from you through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you look at this story about the feeding of the 5,000, you might ask a simple question like, does God still do the impossible today? We sing that nothing is impossible, right, with God? But do we believe it? Do we live like we believe it? In this passage, God accomplishes the impossible through his son, Jesus. And if you haven't noticed by now in all the years of your reading of the word, if you haven't noticed, Jesus is in the business of stretching his disciples, taking them out of their comfort zones. When Jesus sent out his disciples two by two to heal the sick and to set the demon-possessed free, were they successful, do you think, because of their great faith? Or rather, did they go out with the idea of obedience and return in amazement about what God had accomplished through them in the name of Jesus, for they did go out in his name and by his authority. They were sent out with the authority of Jesus and the disciples were faithful to respond in obedience with every intention of fulfilling the task, the work that Jesus had given them to do. He sent them out to do what really and truly would have been considered impossible, right? Had they relied solely on themselves. The disciples were present when Jesus performed his very first miracle. Remember that one? The turning the water into wine at the wedding feast. So perhaps it was Jesus' question that threw Philip. Philip, where can we buy bread to feed all these people. And Philip answers responsibly reminding us that doubt often dresses with dignity and indignity. Six months wages, Philip says, would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. This is the same person who earlier declared breathlessly to his friend Nathaniel that what? He had found him, right? found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. We see in Philip, I think, what we recognize in our own lives, this harboring of doubt and faith within the same body. One day, Philip is embarrassingly exuberant over signs that the reign of God has come near, and the next he frets skeptically over the financial bottom line. I believe, said the man in Mark's gospel, whose son was on the verge of death. Remember that? And immediately he cries out to Jesus, help my unbelief. This father was singing a chorus that we know by heart as Christians. In our text this morning, Andrew adds his own ambivalence to the mix of the situation. Uh, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, and we think, yes, faith, right? But what are they among so many people? Doubt begins with a statement that could be, and a thought, an idea, that could be based on faith, but ends with a comment that points to doubt. Nothing human is not a broth of false and true. That's an observation of an American writer and theologian, Frederick Buechner. There is always some doubting in our believing. 
I will never take more than a few steps across the water before a little voice in my head begins to whisper, like, Philip, where are we to buy? Six months' wages won't do it. Or like Andrew, what are they among so many, those five loaves and those two fish? But brothers and sisters, here is the good news. If there is doubting in our believing, then by the grace of God, there is also believing in our doubting. The very nature of faith is that it gravitates to the faithless. Whenever I am weak, Paul reasoned with peculiar logic of the twice born because he was born of the flesh from his mother's womb but also born of the spirit of God whenever I am weak Paul reasoned then I am strong we need to realize that obedience is faith in action in 2nd Kings 5 we find an individual who learned this lesson do you remember the tale the story about Naaman who was the commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was an individual who was suffering from some form of leprosy. Luckily for him, a young Israelite girl who had been taken captive happened to be serving in his wife's uh, place in their home, serving Naaman's wife. And she mentions to her mistress that there is a prophet in Israel who is capable of healing her master's condition. Naaman shares this info with this king who dispatches him to the king of Israel with a request, a letter to the king of Israel that asks that his servant be healed. Well, the king of Israel kind of gets it all messed up. He misreads the request and only sees negativity in what that could even be coming before him about. He makes the comment, am I God? to give death or life, tearing his clothes rather than pointing Naaman to the prophet, Elisha. Well, hearing of it, Elisha intervened, and he sends word, and he says of Naaman, let him come to me. Naaman expected Elisha to do something spectacular and public that would bring healing. And you know, when we think that way, it often gets us into trouble because faith is not related to doing spectacular things, but to obeying a spectacular God. Do we hear that, church? Faith is not related to doing spectacular things, but to obeying a spectacular God. Being sent a prescription by a messenger of Elisha to wash seven times in the Jordan, well, guess what? It don't set too well with this highfalutin commander I mean he's come prepared with all of his garb that communicates his status with his bags full of treasures he's expecting some kind of public show and instead Elisha doesn't even entertain him with an audience he just sends him a word and a prescription go down to the Jordan and wash in the river Jordan seven times well, he's less than happy, okay? He's human, he's mad. But his servants advised him, if the prophet had commanded you to do something great, would you have not done it? How much rather than when he says to wash and be clean? And we know the story. We know that Naaman follows that advice and he follows the prescription that Elisha gives and he does go down and he does wash he does exactly what Elisha has sent for him to do. And we know that his obedience, his following that course of action, resulted in his healing, and not just his healing, but he goes back to Elisha to declare Israel's God is now his God. And brothers and sisters, don't be surprised when faith encounters obstacles. Some common obstacles are past failures, present difficulties, probabilities, and even the silence of God. In Matthew's Gospel, we find a Canaanite woman crying out to Jesus for her daughter to be delivered from the demon that is tormenting her. And Jesus' silence and his reason for it, he tells her, I was sent only to the lost sheep 
of the house of Israel. That silence and the reason for his silence develops into an insult using the word dog. It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But this woman, bless her heart, she is humble and the condition of her daughter just drives her to be bold and to be confident in her belief and her faith that Jesus, the son of David, can bring healing to her daughter, even if she's not the one for whom he's come to rescue. And you know what? Jesus is just like blown away. He tells her, O oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. Brothers and sisters, true faith grows in the presence of obstacles. If things came easy for us, if we could do it all by ourselves, if we could walk this Christian journey without ever calling on the Holy Spirit, just in our own power and strength, well, what is that? If things came easy for us, if we could do them all by ourselves, there would be no need to depend on the God who has rescued us in the Son of Jesus Christ. There would only be self-glorification. Well, look what I just did. You know, I didn't think I could do that, but you know, and I'm thinking, wow, I'm pretty good. But when there is a seemingly impossible task ahead and God empowers us to do it, the glory goes to him. Amen? So yes, the most faithful encounter obstacles along the way in their journey. Faith has a voice and it has a path. Our faith is expressed through what we say, through our speech. We can talk ourselves into unbelief and we can talk ourselves into the blessings of God. The one condition though is that we must speak in agreement with the will of God. And that being true, we will then possess what we confess. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will and he will direct your paths. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6. When we continue to walk in faith, when we take that step, first step, the next step, the step after that, even when we're feeling doubt, then guess what? You're a powerful witness to others. And we are an encouragement to them. Make the people sit down, Jesus instructed his believer, doubter, disciples. And they did. We can assume that they helped feed the crowd before them, even though only moments before, they probably had one eye shot shut, you know, during the blessing, and the other one peeled on those five loaves and those two fish. After all had eaten, the scriptures tell us, after all had been eaten, all were satisfied. Jesus tells his disciples to go out and to gather up fragments, and they did that too. For John, as much as faith is fundamental to his notion of what it means to relate to Jesus, here he takes the idea in kind of a different direction. In feeding thousands with few loaves and even less fish, faith, it seems, is more about what is done than what is believed possible. Do you hear that? Faith, it seems, is more about what is done than what is believed possible. If the disciples' lives are a weaving of doubt and faith, then never mind all those mixed materials, you still end up with a blanket that's good enough to warm against the cold. Once advised to preach faith until you have faith, John Wesley passed this on to others. It's as if he were stating the obvious. Kind of like saying, hey, you know, doubt all you care to. Doubt the miracles. Doubt the prospect of getting that next building built. Doubt the effectiveness of your ministries or the fruitfulness of your mission. 
Doubt all you want. But in the meantime, stay with the work as though you didn't. Doubt all you want. And I could think of a lot of doubts that we could probably articulate about our future as a church, as the body of Christ in this community, about our community itself, about, about how to or how not to reach those in our midst with the good news of Jesus Christ. Doubt all you want, but in the meantime, stay with the work as though you didn't. Well, Philip registers doubt, and Andrew weighs in with his own measure of it. And when they are done, Jesus reaches across them for a basket belonging to a little boy. And he offers a blessing, and then he tells them to go to work. Miracles of miracles, brothers and sisters, they do just that. They do as Jesus instructs them. I've noticed, I noticed this morning in the bulletin that uh, the next movie that we're going to see is End of the Spear, which is an awesome movie. I hope you guys do not miss that if you have not seen it. Uh, and Lorraine, I had put it on my list with another movie to call you sometime and say, here are two, Lorraine, that, that, Lorraine, that would be great. And uh, another one is uh, one that Dee and I saw several years ago called Faith Like Potatoes. And it is uh, a movie about a, a biographical movie about Angus Buchan, and I'm not sure I'm saying that, Buchan, I guess is how it's pronounced, um, a true story based on his life, a Scottish farmer living in Zambia, growing maize, I believe, was his crop, and he takes his family, packs up his family, and immigrates from Zambia to South Africa, where his luck doesn't hold out too well. And he, guess what, encounters all kinds of obstacles and all kinds of hardships and personal losses and tragedies and is at the end of his rope. His behavior is spiraling out of control until his wife asks him one day, would you like to go to church? Would you come with me to the local church? And he goes and in the midst of his distress, he hears all of these other farmers who are in the same boat that he is, at least as far as environment and droughts and all of those things that work against a crop coming to full harvest, are sharing their testimonies of God's work in their lives. And they influence him to make a decision to ask Jesus into his life. They make, he makes a decision not only to give his life to Jesus, but to dedicate his family to Jesus, to dedicate his farm to Jesus. And then this incredible journey begins to, to, to take place. And I'm not going to tell you all the details because I think we might get to see that in the future. In the midst of doubt, of, of his doubt or the doubt of the community, they've all been told not to plant their crops, which would be potatoes, unless you have irrigation. But Angus has been praying to God and he feels that God wants him to trust him and to plant a crop of potatoes. It's an expensive crop, and if it fails, he knows that he'll lose his farm. But he does it anyway. And as others kind of tease and ridicule or wonder what in the heck he's doing it or why he's doing it, his wife says, you know what, if Angus believes that God told him to plant potatoes, then he should go and do what God says. And harvest time comes, and looking on, Angus's longtime foreman loosens and turns the ground to reveal a miracle, an abundance of potatoes, big potatoes, <laughs> not shriveled up, drought-ridden potatoes. We're talking about big potatoes. And Angus says, faith is like potatoes. You can't see what God is doing, but you believe. Angus toiled over those fields. He prayed over those fields. He prayed for rain. He prayed for, he nurtured that, that field through his relationship with Jesus Christ and his faith and his prayer. And even though he could not see with the naked eye what God was doing below the surface, he believed God's word 
and he counted on God's promises. Angus reminds us that the condition for a miracle is difficulty. However, the condition for a great miracle is not difficulty, but impossibility. Anything, church, seems impossible to you when it comes to thinking about what we could do as a church, how we could serve the Lord as a church, how we could reach wider and deeper within our own congregation. What seems impossible? Like the disciples before us, I think what we need to do is take Jesus into our boat, amen? And join him in work that seems impossible and maybe even foolish to some folks so that we too may immediately reach our destination in the will of God. Let us pray together. Most gracious and loving Lord, we give ourselves to you. We give our ministries to you. We give this body of Christ to you. And as you continue to reveal ways to us in which we can be your people in this place, through so many things like socks for nursing home residents and supplies for teachers and, and Bible clubs after school, Help us to continue to do the work in faith of what we do not see, but do the work that we believe that you have called us to. Help us to touch the lives of others in our community. Help us to show them the love of Jesus Christ. Help us to have eyes to see and, and hearts to entertain the things that we believe we hear from you through prayer. Lord, we thank you for everything that you have helped us to accomplish to show your love to others. For we do look for ways to be in service through outreach and mission. Help us to be on fire for those who live in this world without the light and love of Jesus Christ, without any knowledge, who every day face obstacles and challenges and they do it all on their own and all by themselves. Lead us to those people. Give us your testimony, your word for those people that they might love you, that they might find the journey of faith that awaits them and that they might serve others in the name of the Holy God. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. Lord God, we thank you for our many blessings. We thank you for the health that you have given us to carve out a life, to make a living, to take care of our families. We thank you for the resources which you provide when we simply want to follow you and follow your way. Lord, take these, our offerings, our gifts, our tithes, our very selves. take the things that we give and that we sacrifice on this day, the things with which we place in the plate. And Lord, we count on your promise to multiply these, our resources, so that we might lead others to your son, Jesus Christ, through acts and deeds and through word and love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Now remain standing as we sing our last hymn, number 131, Jesus Saves. Brothers and sisters, will you receive a blessing? Yes. Go into the wonder and the beauty and the gift of this day, knowing that Jesus the Christ has called you to be his hands, to be his feet, to be his very heart and voice. Amen? And to be watchful of each and every opportunity, grocery store, gas station, mall, school, soon be back, wherever places we find ourselves, even in a restaurant, but be alert and aware of the opportunities that he gives for us to speak a kind word, a loving word, and point persons to Jesus Christ. We are a peculiar people, and I suppose that fits us well, doesn't it? As Christians, we want to be, and we are called to be, different from the world. So, may it be so with us. Go in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, in the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.